Ladies and gentlemen, you need to open just a newspaper every day and you read about the climate change. You read about natural disasters happening everywhere in the world. And at the same time, our dependency on the energy, the energy crisis, dependency on countries like Russia. We need to find solutions. We need to find ways to supply our energy for the future without that it has a negative effect on the climate. Now, let us look where most of our energy comes from. And it will surprise you, most of the energy we use on Earth is coming from the sun, indirectly. Fossil fuels, coal, oil, gas, they were 10,000, 100,000 years ago, plants here on Earth. They have been covered with sediments and slowly by pressure they have been turned into fossil fuels we have now. Wind energy is driven by temperature differences on Earth and photovoltaic cells directly convert the sunlight into electricity. But what is happening in the sun? Well, actually in the sun, a process is taking place called nuclear fusion. Very light atoms are smashed together and they create a lot of energy. That was already a million years ago and it will go on for more million years. And so the question is, can we make use of that form of energy here on Earth or Otherwise, can we make a star or many small stars on Earth to generate, uh, generate our electricity? Well, let me first, before I take you in the story, tell you why we would like to have nuclear fusion working here. Well, it's clean. I already mentioned that. There's no CO2 emission. It's safe. There's no chance of a meltdown or uh, a chain reaction. We don't have long-lived radioactive waste. It's baseload energy, you turn it on when you need it, and you turn it off when you don't need it, but it's not that you have to wait for the wind to blow or the sun to shine. It has a small footprint, so you don't need much land space, and the fuel is abundantly available for 10,000 to 100,000 of years. So what is nuclear fusion? And to explain that, let me first explain you about the simplest atom we have, that's hydrogen. So if you look at the hydrogen, there's an atomic nucleus, it's a proton, it's positively charged, and around it circles an electron. The electron is much lighter. And this is really the most easy atom we have. But it comes also with a second form, a second isotope. It's called deuterium. And deuterium is twice as heavy as the normal hydrogen, and that's because the atomic nucleus has a proton and a neutron, and the proton and neutron are about the same weight. Deuterium is chemically exactly the same as hydrogen. You almost cannot dis distinguish it. And it occurs abundantly on Earth in water. Every liter of water, whether it's your drinking water, whether it's seawater, river water, rainwater, it contains 33 milligram of deuterium. We can very easily take that out. Now, there's a third form of hydrogen. You could call that super-heavy hydrogen. It's a and the atomic nucleus has a proton and two neutrons. It's three times as heavy, and the tritium doesn't occur on Earth. So we have to make it in one or the other way. But now the important thing is that we need to fuse on Earth deuterium and tritium. That's really the easiest reaction. And we only look there at the atomic nuclei, which are positively charged. So this is how the fusion reaction looks like. We take deuterium, tritium, positively charged. They try to, to repel each other. So we need a lot of energy to smash them together. But if we do that, we get helium and a neutron and a lot of energy. The helium is not radioactive. It's not toxic, so you can use it again. And so in this way, we can create uh, electricity. Now, let's go back in the sun. The sun has a temperature of 15 million degrees, and it has a very high gravity, so the particles are very close to each other. On Earth, we have a problem. We cannot make this very high gravitational forces, and therefore, we need a temperature which is a little bit higher. It's only a factor of 10, 150 million degrees. So can we do that? Wow, it sounds difficult. Well, I take you in a small thought experiment. I take here a, a tube. I made it transparent so that we can see what is going on. And I fill it with a gas of uh, deuterium and tritium. Of course, I first made it vacuum. I took everything else out. Deuterium and tritium. 
And now I'm going to heat it. Think about the microwave heating, like you have in your kitchen. You turn the heating on, and then what happens at some point is that the atoms, they fall apart in the nuclei, the positive nuclei, and the negative electrons. This is what we call a plasma. So in the tube, there's as many positive as negative charged particles, but they're all charged. So if you look with a microscope, you only see charged particles. Now, the idea is that if I turn the heating higher on, the particles get more and more energy. It's like when you boil the water, when you make it hotter and hotter, the water starts to bubble more and more. That's also here. And the idea is that if you make the temperature high enough, that the particles have enough energy when they collide, they can lead to fusion. Well, you see a problem here, because the particles, they go in all directions, they hit the walls. And we need to do something. And their nature helps us a little bit, because if we apply a magnetic field, then all the particles, they line up to the magnetic field lines, and they only move along the magnetic field lines, they spiral around, and it's almost like a runner in a curtain rail. So they cannot hit the side walls. That's fine. They still can collide because they go in, in two directions. But we still see a problem that at the end of the tube they run out or they hit the end tube. And for that we basically bend it around. And then we get a device which is called a tokamak. It's a Russian abbreviation. And you see on the left-hand side um, the, uh, the tube, which is like a donut with the magnetic coils around. And on the right side, I uh, put a, a cross-section. And usually we al elongate that a little. And the magnetic field lines, they are, let's say, organized like shells in an onion. So the particles, they keep basically attached to the shells. But you see also further out that there's this purple region which basically doesn't close on itself, it's not ellipse anymore, but it leads to these two gray blocks. That's what we call the diverter. That's our ashtray of the reactor. What do I mean? Let's look to a real reactor. So this is a cross-section with the very light gray on the outside, that's the vacuum vessel. Uh, the darker gray on the inside, that is our blanket. The blanket we use to get the heat out. But we also use it to breed our tritium. I said before that we don't have it in nature. We need to make it there, and we make it from lithium. But then all the particles and all the heat which we generate in the center needs to get out. And then when it crosses this brownish layer, then all the heat goes down, and it comes in the diverter. Now, we come to another problem. I told you about the 150 million degrees we have to make. But here we have a heat load of 10 to 20 megawatt per square meter. Well, for you, just a number, for me too, by the way. But um, this is the same heat load as you have in the sun. So we need to develop materials you can lay on the surface of the sun and which don't melt. And you will say, well, that's impossible. Well, for scientists, nothing is impossible, but it's, it's, it's very difficult. But we can do it. And I will show you. Uh, we use for our high heat flux component, so for the diverter in the bottom, we use tungsten. Tungsten has a very high melting temperature of 3,000 degrees. Uh, you can see here in this uh, picture, a cooling pipe is running right to the middle of these tungsten blocks. Now we are going to expose it to a heat flux similar to we have in the sun, so the same heat load. And this is what happened uh, after uh, 18 and a half hours. And you can see there's almost no damage. You see a little bit of black spot to this when we use a helium plasma, but for the rest, it works. So we have the materials we can lay in the sun, uh, which we can use in the reactor. Now the 150 million degrees. Well, you have to believe me here. This is a picture of the biggest operating tokamak in the world. It's the Joint European Taurus. It's in the United Kingdom, but it's run by European scientists. And on the right side, I overlaid a picture of a hot plasma. And in the center, there's almost no light. And it's because it's so hot that you don't have any, any radiation of, of, of light. The light you see at the very edge, that's where the atoms become, um, where they ionize, where they split in, in nuclei and electrons. So there we see light. At the very bottom, we see light. That's the diverter where much of the heat goes. Now, in this device, earlier this year, we had a new world record, 59 megajoule of fusion energy. Well, again, 59 megajoule, for many of you, just a number. 
One megajoule is the energy you need to heat a kettle of water, to boil a kettle of water. And a kettle of water, it's an English size, an English measure. They have all these crazy sizes. Um, one kettle is 1.6 liter. So 59 megajoule is 100 liters. Now, the 100 liter we brought to boil with 170 microgram of deuterium and tritium. So 100 microgram deuterium, 70 microgram of deuterium. It's basically here, this little piece, a, is a grain of sand. It's that size. If you want to do the same with coal, you would need four kilograms. I can show it also in another way, that fusion is very power dense. And um, if we have one kilo of fusion fuel, so half a kilo of deuterium, which I now have depicted as a bottle because it's transparent, half a kilo of lithium. This is equivalent to, uh, to basically four and a half million liters of oil, 10 million kilos of coal, 4.8 million uh, cubic meter of gas, and it's also much more power dense than nuclear fission. Uh, where you need 100 kilogram uranium for the same energy content. So fusion is, in that sense, very good. We don't need much fuel, and we have enough water and lithium batteries uh, to, to fuel. This is how a future, future uh, uh, fusion plant looks like. So in the center, you have the very hot plasma at 150 million degrees. A little bit further out, you have the vacuum vessel. And inside the vacuum vessel, you have the... Uh, heat exchangers, that, that's where we take the heat out. And then around that, the magnets with which we make the magnetic field. And then the heat goes to, uh, to turbines, which then drive electricity. It sounds very simple. Now, I showed you the experiments of JAT. Uh, we do that on many experiments worldwide, and we have demonstrated that fusion is plausible. We're now building, with many countries in the world, ITER, which, which will come in operation around 27, which will show that fusion is feasible because we create, for the first time, more fusion energy than the energy we put in. And the next step is the demonstration reactor demo, which generates electricity, and then we can commercialize fusion. A few words on ITER. ITER is a project which is an international collaboration of China, Europe, India, Japan, South Korea, the Russian Federation and the US. It's still up and running despite the war in Ukraine. The, the Russia is still uh, pretty much involved in this project. This will deliver 500 megawatts of fusion power versus 50 megawatts which we put in. So a factor of 10 multiplication. Uh, the experiment is uh, for 80% ready. It's being built in southern France. And on the right side, you see a picture. Uh, it's about 30 meters high, 30 meters diameter. And you see this very little man with a yellow circle around to give you the size. So it's really a huge device. In parallel, we are working on DEMO. So DEMO is the uh, demonstration reactor which delivers electricity. And this device, which will come in operation somewhere 2040, 2050, um, will deliver 500 megawatts of net electricity to the grid. So this is great. Now you might think that society has only benefited from fusion once uh, the fusion reactor works, and also industry might be only interested at the time. But there, actually, uh, we have examples. For instance, the uh, company which helped us developing the superconducting cables for the magnetic coils, they had patents out of that, and the patents are now used in medical resonance imaging um, equipment. And just this afternoon, I had a meeting with that company, and they make an annual turnover with, of two and a half billion euros. Just this. Um, a company in the Netherlands which was involved in explosive forming of metal sheets, we asked them whether they could make the vacuum vessel of ether. They're now making the cockpit of the Airbus with the same technique. And finally, also remote handling, a technique which we pioneered on the Jet European Taurus already 20 years ago. It's now used in many other fields of uh, science, space science, but also it's used for medical surgery, so medical robots, deep sea robots, also nuclear decommissioning, etc. So let me come towards the end. Fusion is really moving at a very fast pace, and it will be an essential element of our future energy mix. Let, you, uh, let me take you again to the benefits. It's clean. It doesn't emit any CO2. It's safe. Um, it's, it's not like fission. We cannot have a mil meltdown. We cannot have a chain reaction. 
And um, at the same time, also no long-lived waste, because the helium, as I said, the end product is not radioactive. Our wall of the reactor becomes radioactive because we can choose the materials there. The materials can be used again after 100 years, so you don't need to store waste for 10,000 years. Baseload energy, so you don't have to wait until the wind blows or, un or until the sun shines. And um, it has a small footprint. So I have here a picture of a reactor which delivers 2 gigawatt electric power. 2 gigawatt electric power is the power you need for 1.5 million households. So 5 million people. So that's basically a rather big city. And if you would like to do that with wind or with solar cells, you would need 6 million uh, photovoltaic cells or 660 windmills using a very large land space which you could use for agriculture or just for having nature. And then for the same power plant, 2 gigawatts, you would need only 500 kilogram of fuel per year. So 500 kilogram you do in the trunk of your, your car. Any car, you can even a Fiat uh, Cinquecento, you can load that in and you can bring it there. So let me end now with a quote from one of the most pronounced and famous scientists of late time, Stephen Hawking. He passed away a few years ago and he wrote a book just before that, Brief Answers to the Big Questions. And he answers there many questions. And the very last question he answers in the book is, what world-changing idea, small or big, would you like to see implemented by humanity? And then he says, this is easy. I would like to see the development of fusion power to give an unlimited supply of clean energy. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.